Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Road to World Football Show. I am Patrick Doherty, joined as always by Mr. Denny Carter as we continue with our division preview series. Today is the AFC East, and we have two very esteemed The Athletic slash New York Times beat writers uh, for the Bills. We have Mr. Joe Biscalia joining us right off the jump. Uh, later for the Jets, we have Mr. Zach Rosenblatt. And yeah, Joe, I'm I was beyond, I've been way too proud of myself for remembering how to pronounce Biscalia. That was kind of <laughs> all I thought about today. Soak and, it in. Yes. Soak it in. You're one of the few. Thank you very much. We've been soaking in, by the way, the desolation of Rudy Gobert. And uh, well, no, it's true they're winning though. So I don't know. Maybe he'll take that. He's happy about it at least. Yeah, there you go. Kind of. Watching watching some Olympic basketball, and of course, on the networks of NBC, um, USA, NBC, Peacock. Uh, we love the Olympics. No, we. On our can road. I can I just say quickly? I, I actually got a message from from a listener, an avid listener to the show, uh, when when they heard that we might have on a Bills beat writer. They said, well, if you have Joe from The Athletic, this is how you pronounce his last name. You got to tell Pat. I swear someone <laughs> someone actually told me that because because they, they know they know how how seriously you take it. I mean, you you spend oh, yeah. more time grinding last names than anybody in the industry, Pat. <laughs> it, it's no, Biscalia. That... It's Carter. Um, yes. Or Denny, so. yes, indeed. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, even though you just told me how to say it. I, I don't. Darty? Dart, I tried it. Darty. Yeah, just act like Darty. you're doing an obnoxious Irish accent or impression. <laughs> and then just think, what's the hardest possible way to say Darty? And then say it. That, that works. Uh, we well, love you know, Olympics. More, more importantly, more importantly than Joe's last name, Joe's bringing fire hair to the show. I know. His hair Ooh. is looking better than ever. It's, and it's, it's that it's quite, that quite means incredible. a lot coming from from you because I know <laughs> I know that you have a pretty strong brand as far as the hair goes. Yeah, so. I, I, I do. I do. I, and I, I kind of accidentally cultivated that, but I, I have to compliment the I mean the 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 swoop, the size, the the height, the the cut on the sides it all looks very good, Joe. Many things. Many the things, things that people don't see behind the curtain. Um, so it's <laughs> some of the best hair in the industry, but it's undoubtedly one of the very best beat writers in the industry. And for a long time at that, Joe has been on the, the Bills beat for almost as long as I can remember, despite being extremely young. Uh, he, he's 27, has been on the Bills beat for 42 <laughs> years, though. Uh, just one of the best. And Joe, we know we're going to get some good stuff for you. We have to start in the Bills receiver core, though. That is where the questions reside in fantasy football this year. And, you know, everything changed for Josh Allen and this offense when Stefan Diggs was acquired in 2020. That was the turning point on the Josh Allen and Sean McDermott project. But now both Steph and Gabe Davis are gone after, you know, kind of underachieving 2023s and a totally new supporting cast and fantasy managers. They naturally want to know who the quote unquote number one receiver is going to be in their absence. But on paper, you know, this kind of looks like a grab bag situation a one you've written about a lot where we could see a lot of different kind of formations, a lot of different sets. And mm-hmm. we'll just start though with number 33 overall pick Keon Coleman. Uh, does his draft position, you know, the Josh Allen seal of approval, apparently pounding the table for Keon Coleman, make him the closest thing we're going to get to a true number one receiver in this offense. Or does that just not exist this year, at least to begin the year? Yeah. I don't know that it will exist this year once they, once they get to the start of the regular season. Now it could shake out uh, as we go along injuries, what have you. But um, I think right now in terms of Keon Coleman, they wanted to add someone like him because they haven't really had anyone like him in the receiver room for years now. I mean, they, they went into one year with um, Diggs, Cole Beasley, and John Brown, which the the top height on that is, what, six feet, if that. Um, and now they add Keon Coleman, uh, who is a throwback to one of Josh's first years uh, with the Bills when they had Kelvin Benjamin, who was – not that Kelvin Benjamin no. <laughs> from Carolina. <laughs> no, no. Um, um, it was a kind of a shell of himself at that the point. The QB rating was very low on that connection. Yeah, on the Josh yeah it, was, it wasn't great. Connection. And that was he was kind of the catalyst to where they're like, okay, let's not let's not bring in these guys who uh, who can go up and get it. Let's bring in separators, which gives Josh Allen a little bit more of a uh, more of a chance because his at, at that point his accuracy was a little bit more waning than it is now. Now that he has progressed as a passer, they're like, okay, well, let's bring in a red zone threat, someone who can go up and get it, that that sort of guy. And that's what Keon Coleman is. I think for him, he is their prototypical X receiver. You know, I, I've, uh, 
wondered whether or not they would use him in the slot. I haven't really seen all too much of it. They they keep saying, oh, no one no one has a position, no one has a position, but they always line up in the same spot every single time. So, like, <laughs> what, what do you want from me? Um, Keon Coleman, to me, uh, is someone who I think can do really well in the short areas of the field and in the red zone specifically. But where I have seen him struggle to separate is in the intermediate to deep. And that, I think could limit his overall ceiling for what he can do ultimately within this offense from a fantasy perspective. Like he's going to be great from real life perspective because he's a great blocker Um, that short stuff. He can be that target. He can bring in contested stuff, that red zone stuff that, that will work well, but let let's also not forget that this is someone who averaged just a little over 50 yards a game in college uh, in, in all his time at Florida state. So it's I don't think they have a game breaker here, but it is someone that can contribute to their top four immediately. And that is going to be an attractive thing. I just, from a fantasy perspective, I'm not exactly sure uh, the juice will be worth the ADP squeeze. You just basically are in alignment with fantasy drafters. I think his current ADP is wide receiver 45. So like a very Mm -hmm. low end wide receiver four. Does does that still sound too high to you? Maybe like a wide receiver four, you're, you're basically in contention for flex duty every week. Do you yeah. think even that's maybe a little too rich for Keon Coleman? I don't know that I would be willing to trust it at the beginning of the season until I see it with my eyes. Just because I think this year's receiver core, and this is a this is a broader thing, is I'm not sure who's going to lead receiving from one week to the next. I'm not sure who's going to lead in snaps from one week to the next. I, they have a very cemented top four right now, which is Coleman, Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel and the guy that no one is talking about that is going to get way more time than everyone expects is Mac Hollins. They love him. (laughs) I figured (laughs) me, me talking about Mac Hollins is is someone that uh, Denny could go in and pound the table for, because I feel like he's right, (laughs) right on brand for you. Um, (laughs) Denny always um, wants the iconoclastic players. They are the contrarian. That's what I'm saying. The big, the, the big hair goes barefoot everywhere. He's, uh, he's, (laughs) he's already getting like 30 players to go, to go barefoot in all their walkthroughs really uh, on the roster. Yeah. He's a, he's a cult of personality type and um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, Matt Collins is a guy everywhere he goes, the coaches love him. His teammates love him. And I do think, you know, as funny as it sounds, because we, you know, we we operate strictly in numbers and fantasy, that, that that does that does matter. So do you do you see Hollins being like a staple in three receiver sets for Buffalo this year? Um, maybe not. I, I don't know that there's like a locked in top three. I think there's going to be a heavy rotation amongst the top four. Uh Coleman to me is an ex receiver only. Shakir, um, he's mostly been working in the slot. Uh, but he also can play some Z. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that will help him stay on the field in 12 personnel sets when they go with Knox and Kincaid both on the field. Um, Samuel does slot. He does Z. He he works out of the backfield. I'm not sure how much playtime, like if he's going to be on the field all the time. Uh, I could very easily see Shakir being the top um, playtime getter out of this Mm -hmm. four, and coming in around like 70% of offensive snaps. So it's just okay. a it's just a hodgepodge of yeah. wide receiver snaps to go around. And Mac Hollins, where he fits into this, he can give you reps at X. He can give you reps at Z, um, as we've seen so far throughout this camp. And and I think that they like that his ability to go up and get the ball too. Josh Allen has really taken a shine to him. And whenever Josh Allen takes a shine to somebody, they usually get playtime. I, I will say that, you know, what, what you mentioned about um, maybe Shakir leads the team in routes or snaps and it's only around 70 percent. Um, I think that's part of a growing trend across the NFL. I think that's mm-hmm. typified with the Green Bay offense where you have guys who are going to be rotating in and out because they have four or five really good receivers there. Um, so that that maybe that shouldn't be as shocking as as it as it would have been years ago. I did want to ask quickly about Curtis Samuel. He had his best year as a pro under Joe Brady in Carolina it it, I thought you know going into this season I thought that he would be locked in every down slot guy it Mm. sounds like you're saying he could be more rotational yeah he I think if I had to guess who trots out onto the field when they go into their starting offense and it's 11 personnel I would tend to think it's probably Shakir Samuel and Keon Coleman um, with one of the two tight ends out there 
but I don't think that it's like uh, it's like how it used to be here in Buffalo, where they got three had three guys who had the heavy amount of of snap time, and and that's that was basically their offense. I, there's going to be a lot of mixing and matching. Samuel's going to go into the backfield. Um, he's going to get some time. Like uh, I I probably think he'll land somewhere between the 55 to 70 percent of snaps. That that would be my guess, just based on what I've seen so far. It's probably same thing for Keon Coleman. Matt Collins probably sub 50, I would say. Um, I'd, I'd have to run through the numbers to see if right. that all mm-hmm. actually shakes out and, and makes okay. sense. But uh, but that's that's kind of the the typified roles that I see for these four guys right now. And yeah, Samuel, they're going to try to get him the ball in creative ways. Uh, Joe Brady is a creative guy, and he didn't really get a chance to show a lot of it last year because he basically took over the Dable slash Dorsey offense and did as best as he could with it. And so I think that we're going to see a little bit of different uh, different stuff this year. Joe, just I'll put you on the spot where if you had to roster one of these top four Bills receivers in fantasy, who would it be? And your fantasy managers are kind of approaching this from the same angle you're coming from. Where there's not super high expectations for any of them. There are cases kind of being made for all of them, but no mm-hmm. one's got like an ADP that's leaping off the page. But if you had to roster one of these Bills wideouts, like who is your choice from the gut right now? Uh, based on where you can get him and the trust he has with Josh Allen, I'd probably go with Khalil Shakir. Uh, just because I think he's going to be on the field the most of the four guys, which will give him more opportunities. Josh Allen looks for him in clutch moments. He's got some yards after catch ability to him. He can line up in a couple of different spots to where um, if they are in 12 personnel, which I'm not sure how much that they'll do this year because they've kind of went away from it after, you know, touting it's 11 and a half personnel with Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid last year around the draft. Um, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure we're going, going to see it what, a crazy amount, but Shakir at least does give you the ability to stay on the field in those in those settings to give you a bit more of a receiving aspect from from that position. So I would probably go Shakir. I don't know wh- where is he going right now. Well, like 10th, so their 11th ADPs round or like that? are very jumbled. Coleman's wide receiver forty five. Curtis Samuel's wide receiver forty nine. Shakir is fifty five. He's he's around one hundred and ten, one hundred and eleven. It's like the what, what round is that? Like the eleventh round, tenth round. All day Shakir then. All yeah. Day. Yeah. So I think you might be moving his ADP as we speak. Oh, <laughs> I hate when I do that. No, yeah. no, it's very, very good. And Danny's going to ask you about those tight ends in a second, by the way. But I was hoping you you would we would get to the Shakir thing and how he might lead in snaps, but that still might only be 70% of the snaps. And mm-hmm. I think you kind of alluded to a definite Bills trend, but almost a league-wide trend where there's like an identity crisis about what kind of wideouts teams even want right now, where they went all small in separation. The big receiver was almost getting like, cast out of the game but now they're kind of coming back and as my long preamble to saying so we know who the top four bills guys are but with with this being said like where the bills don't even entirely know how they want to approach it could there be like a true dark horse like chase claypool or kj hamler uh get some playing time or are they just gonna be true role players maybe guys who might not even make the 53 man roster. yeah i don't i don't know that hamler's gonna make the team his best shot will be as the return guy um chase claypool has not practiced since I think July 28th yeah, with that's its co-entry. Kind of yeah. yeah. And he, yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. they called it day to day. It's now been past a week. So it's, it's an existential question at this point of what does day to day mean if it goes past a week? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's, there's that piece of the puzzle, but he has not practiced and, and he's been passed by um, one guy who was an undrafted rookie for them last year that they really like. Uh, Tyrell Shavers. This is a deep, deep oh, cut. Um, right special and special teams, him. special teams gunner. Uh, he is someone that can play all three positions. He's definitely pushing for a spot on the 53. And the one we didn't talk about is Marquez Valdez Scantling, oh, who yes. seems to be there. Um, did he, forget about him to be, uh, quite literally. Well, forgot I mean, him. I mean, he's kind of outside of the top four and look, looking in right now. Um, I think he'll make the 53 just because he has about 2.3 million in guaranteed money. If they were to cut him, um, that would go against their cap this year. And they're not really in that position to do that, but I could also see him because he gives them no special teams value whatsoever (laughs) being one of those guys to uh, be a healthy scratch to begin the year and then fill in as, as they kind of go along. Look, MVS 
fresh off a of Super Bowl, you can't get any mm-hmm. playing time. It's curious. I don't know what the Bills are thinking. <laughs> if the Bills want to be world champions, you play champions. It's that simple. <laughs> the way to beat right. the Chiefs is to become the Chiefs, and to become the Chiefs, you have MBS. That's yeah. it. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, like Pat said earlier, about the the tight end. So I, I think the idea in drafting Dalton Kincaid this year among fantasy managers is that, well, it's the second year. It's time for him to take that that leap into a more prominent role. Stefan Diggs is gone, more target share available, air yards, the whole bit, right? And then you look at the the splits, the t- statistical splits bet- uh, between when Dawson Knox was healthy and on the field and when he wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I think it's cause for major concern. You're talking about uh, a much lower route rate for Kincaid. You're talking about fewer targets, fewer receptions, fewer red zone uh, opportunities uh, with Knox on the field. So, uh, we had a blurb the other day on the site where uh, um, Bill's coaches were talking up Knox is a guy they really like. They want to get on the field. They like, you know, his blocking, his pass catching, what he adds to the offense. Is he a major concern for folks who who really want or think that Kincaid is going to take a, a big step here in year two? I think I think it is a legitimate concern. Um, I do think that they are going to give Kincaid um, a bit more time than they did last year when both guys were healthy. Uh, but I don't know that it's going to be so substantially more that um, that it's going to bridge this gap to where because mm-hmm. uh, I I I'm a fantasy football guy too. I I I, I tend to follow the ADPs and things like that. And it seems like Kincaid's getting drafted pretty highly at this yes. point. He is. And that, if, if that were me, I would just be a little bit, um, I would have a little bit of trepidation just because of how much that they like Dawson Knox and how much Josh likes Dawson Knox. Yeah. Um, that he is, he is uh, Josh's guy and he really? has been for a, for a long time. Um, that's not to say that they're going to stare in the face. Well, we can't play Dawson Kincaid today because Dawson Knox is out there and he's good <laughs> friends with Josh. But I do think that both are going to have a pretty substantial role within this offense. Now, if that means Kincaid can push towards maybe 60 to 65 percent of snaps when both guys are healthy, I think that would be a win in his favor based on what we saw from their usage when both were both were healthy, especially mm-hmm. after Knox came back from the injury. Those final six games, I think Kincaid was under that 60 percent mark on right. play time. Um, so I, I could see it being a 65, 60 to 65 for Kincaid and then for Knox somewhere between 40 to 50 uh, and with some carryover about where they uh, when they're both on the field. Maybe you can help me address this because I've seen a lot of copium from Dalton Kincaid drafters and and the copium is found in this idea that the Bills this season are going to just play a lot of two tight end sets. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that that's happening, but Joe, tell us, is that happening? Are they just going to get both these guys on the field a lot? They're not going to turn into Arthur Smith. Um, That's that's not what I think is going to happen. if they get around 15 to 20% of their snaps, I think that would be on the, on the high side. Um, they, when they entered the season last year under Dorsey, mm-hmm. they ran 12 personnel at like the highest rate in the league in week, in week one. And we saw that slowly go down as, as every single week went. And then when Brady took over, that was still just kind of uh, an up and down. It was like a matchup based thing more than it was a staple of their offense. And that's what I would ex- expect to continue going into this year. But I will say Kincaid is really stinking talented. And if people want to bet on that talent, then by all means go for it. But there are things, namely Dawson Knox, Mm -hmm. that is standing in the way of him having this true to form breakout um, and being, you know, having one of the best tight end seasons in Bill's franchise history, which by the way, is not that difficult to do because they have never had a tight end (laughs) go over. They have never had a tight end go over 726 yards. Wow. 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 In their entire history. Especially in this century, we've had pyrotechnic aerial football for a while now. By the way, I just took a handwritten note. Escalia colon, it's never been more over for Kincaid as tight end. <laughs> no. So uh, we're going to move, try to move the ADP there. We've already taken a lot of your time, but we can't let you get out of here without asking about the backfield. And you mentioned snap percentages. James Cook is a guy who always comes to mind, I think, of snap percentages, where he didn't get the even 50% in a lot of the games last year. He was never really under 40%. And he was usually over 50%, but there were some games where he's like 47, 48% of the snaps. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the kind of more to the backfield to himself this year, but they're still the fourth round rookie. 
Ray Davis, who slots in all too easily. It seems like an early downs goal line carries, you know, the big problem for James Cook and fantasy has been the disastrous lack of touchdowns because of Josh mm-hmm. Allen calling his own number in fantasy. Do you think the role changes at all this year or is Ray Davis just going to kind of keep James Cook locked in the role we've, we've gotten used to in fantasy? Well, what was so interesting last year is that James Cook was in his second season and it he went through the normal Sean McDermott, you did something wrong. Uh, yeah. Now we're going to play Latavius Murray over yes. you for a little bit. Um, it's it's kind of been a staple for, for Sean with some of his younger players, um, but that rectified itself by the end of the season to where James Cook was getting most of the time. And Ty Johnson factored in down the stretch a little bit, but you know, James Cook, they they see him as the guy. He's in his third year. He is their most talented back by a lot. Um, he is exactly what Brandon Bean has always wanted out of the running back position, which is someone that can give you something in the receiving game, as well as uh, being able to run between the tackles, which I do think James Cook is a little underrated in that capacity. So I could see him pushing past the the 60% mark, which would be big for a Bills running would back. would be because we haven't really seen all that much of it since Devin Singletary went on that ridiculous run of where he was getting like 80 to 90% of snaps Mm -hmm. when Zach Moss couldn't get on the field. Um, So I think cook, this is his backfield. I will say, don't, don't count out the Ty Johnson factor here. If if, for people that love, love the Ray Davis stuff, like Ty Johnson, um, they still like him. It's not as though he's just going to go away. Uh, He has the more similar skill set to cook. So mm-hmm. I do wonder if like something happens to Cook, what exactly right. happens to their backfield? And I could see that totally being a split uh, based on situation. But what I do like about Ray Davis is he gives you a three down skill set. We just haven't seen it just yet. I mean, preseason is going to be big for him. We uh, he's such a physically talented player to where he can break tackles and do all that and and get the get the hard runs. But it's so tough to to see if that player has that at the NFL level when you're in training camp and you've had, you know, maybe five live snaps total throughout this the entire two weeks. So I, I, I want to see what he brings to the table in the preseason. I'm sure he's going to get a bunch of time and so they, they can figure it out for themselves. But working in Davis's favor, Ty Johnson has also been day to day with a hamstring injury and uh, hasn't practiced since I think the 29th of July. So there is there is that piece of the puzzle. But hamstrings usually take two to three weeks, something like that. So I, I'm sure Johnson will be back before long. Yeah. To your point on James Cook's playing time going up at the end of the season, from week 10 to 14, that was only four games. There was a buy in there. He never mm-hmm. got over 50% of the snaps. Then for the final four games of the season, he was never under 55% of the snaps. So mm-hmm. you kind of saw it happening in real time. And I, I don't know why I put, you would play James Cook fewer than 60% of the snaps. But uh, yeah, unless not. unless he got tired. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's the only, not, that's the only Thing. Hopefully not. Sorry to talk over you there. Hopefully not challenge accepted by the Bills coaching staff. But we went challenge accepted on keeping you longer than 20 minutes. Yeah. I said <laughs> 22 max. We're at 23. Uh, we really, really appreciate you taking the time. The super busy time of year. You're off day. You're joining us. So we really appreciate that. Let's tell our listeners where they can find you on social media and where they can find your work uh, to spoiler alerts, the New York times, but uh, where can they they find you? Yeah. I'm uh, on Twitter. I'm at Joe Biscalia. There's a sneaky G in there. Uh, So I'm, I'm sorry in advance. (laughs) Uh, And then you you can find all of my work over, over at the athletic. I'm usually writing off every single practice trying to, and like I said, I I play fantasy football too. So I know what I'm looking to, to read. um, And I also know what I want to see from, from a fantasy perspective. So that's, there's that piece of it too. Not like I'm making stuff up and practice (laughs) each and every day. I think there's a fine line, but, but yeah, I, I, I tend to keep, fantasy football people in mind when when i'm looking at some stuff and i can tell that and i can tell that you play fantasy by the way that that, that you write it's nothing explicit but i you know just the experience reading other beat writers i can i can see you know just little snippets of oh okay this guy's grinding the waiver wire every (laughs) team no no matter what you really can tell from the way you do your notebooks and it's a way that pleases everyone because if you if you didn't play fantasy you'd have no idea you were maybe like sneaking some fantasy nuggets in there uh, a reminder, there are some reporters who actually understand that real football and fantasy football were not all that different. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we I mean, the there, same information. there is a firm handshake to be had between real football <laughs> and fantasy football, <laughs> and I, I am here to extend that handshake. 
Joe, thank you so much for taking the time. We'll be reading the rest of the summer. Um, try to get some rest on your day off, even though you probably won't. Probably be grinding the Olympics and maybe ADPs. Yeah, one, one Joe, or the other. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time. And we will be right back after this. Fantasy football just got better this season. One million dollars better. Create or join a private Yahoo Fantasy League and enter the one million dollar NBC sweepstakes. Plus, earn extra entries to win when players on your fantasy roster score a touchdown during an opening opening weekend game on NBC or Peacock. Download the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Million to learn more. And don't forget, experience the Olympics like you have never seen them before. Primetime in Paris tonight on NBC and Peacock uh, through the end of the games. Sorry there if you're watching a video. We had some problem with our promos. Uh, we didn't have problems watching the Olympics, Denny. I uh, continue to mainline them. And yeah, um, I'm very, very proud of our team. Quite a uh, bit. Hope Noah Lyles gets the double in the one in the 200. An exuberant young man. Um, oh, yeah. Did you see by the, any chance last night the Swedish-American Mondo Duplantis? Yes, I in, did. In the high jump. And have you ever seen anything crazier? In I high? don't think I have. I I believe I saw him celebrating like before he made the clearance, <laughs> <laughs> which I was like, wow, you have to be so confident in order to, like to know like, hey, I'm vaulting over like to set a world record. It was a world record, right? It, it was uh, Denny. Yeah. yeah, right. And 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 so and so he knew it. And so he starts celebrating before he clears the bar. And I was like, no, no, get over, man. Get over. He did. He did get over. He got over in world record fashion. And before I knew his backstory, it was a, a little sh shocking. There was a man in a full Swedish uniform who looks very Swedish, like a beautiful Swedish man. <laughs> and then then he begins speaking in a very clear Louisiana accent. Right. <laughs> so, so, very, very interesting for Mr. Well, there, Mondo Duplantis. Oh, uh, there was a French athlete, a French swimmer who spoke like, you know, like had a very normalized, like American type. They do. And they all train pattern. here now. They all train here now. Yeah, but uh, was, amazing yeah. Olympic stuff. And now we're going to get some amazing jet stuff from Mr. Zach Rosenblatt of The Athletic, who joins us now. And Zach, I keep almost saying the Eagles with you because <laughs> I was used to on the Eagles beat for years. Uh, now you've stayed in uh, the... What, what what do we call that region? You've stayed in the you know the greater New York, Philadelphia, uh, megalopolis re region, uh, but you're now <laughs> well, a see, Jets beat writer. Not look a as a, as a Midwesterner, Pat just says the, the whole East Coast is the same. It's, you know, it's all the we're, same. We're all the same. You know, which is which is honestly from Maine, from Maine all the way down to Florida. It's all the same. I'm yeah. as a Marylander. I have nothing to do with 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 you <laughs> up in New York. I you know, but to Pat, it's all the same. No, it's all the same. Amtrak Megalopolis. You get on the Amtrak. It's the one place in the country where it's convenient. And, I've never uh, been on an Amtrak, by the yeah, way. Yeah, Dennis on the Amtrak. Never even seen one. No, but uh, did amazing stuff on the Eagles beat, doing amazing stuff on the Jets beat. You're on a really interesting beat to be in the year 2024, Zach. Uh, it's good. The, the, the team that is all in on a quarterback who hasn't played in two years, and that's just the elephant in the room, 40-year-old Aaron Rodgers and his return not just from a torn Achilles tendon, but you know, several off seasons worth of off the field controversies, you know, most of them minor. Uh, but I don't, know, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not what you do. Don't know what we're talking about with that Aaron Rodgers, And you know, who is an inner circle hall of famer. Like no one debates like the peak level of Aaron Rodgers' play. But when last we left him, he was having his most disappointing statistical season since his rookie year back in 2008, or excuse me, first year starting back in 2008. So we'll just start broadly there. What kind of player have you seen in Jets camp? And are they correct to be all in on him? Are they actually all in on him? Denny was wondering if they've Rodgers proofed this roster with all the running backs they've added. Just what are you seeing with your own eyes, Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, you know, I, I think with the all in thing, I think it is important to remember. And I think people from outside of the Jets fan base forget this sometimes when they made fun of them for like, you know, doing everything Aaron Rodgers wanted. You're forgetting what they've had at quarterback for a long, long time. Like, so they had a chance to go and get Aaron Rodgers. So, okay, like, we'll do whatever we have to do to get them. So I, I don't blame them for that as much as, like, you know, some of the moves specifically they made and and, and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I think he he looks like Aaron Rodgers out there. I mean, I know it's a very simple statement, but he's always going to be a great practice player just because his elite arm talent, his ability to fit the ball in the tight windows and get rid of the ball quickly and make it hard on the defense and stuff like that. So he's looked great. I think there has been some growing pains with the offense as a whole. You know, guys are still learning his, you know, his cadence is constantly changing, his hand signals. That was always the thing when he's in Green Bay. 
I think there's more comfortability than last year, but you have a combination of completely new offensive line, a lot of new pieces on offense with a defense that has been together for three years now. Like they pretty much are the same defense other than, you know, a few pieces here and there, but all the core pieces are the exact same. So defense has been pretty dominant, I would say. I have some concerns about, you know, some of the stuff that's been going on in offense, like specifically the snapping has been an issue. But um, overall, like Aaron, you know, if he's healthy, even if he plays at the level he did two years ago, which, like you said, was one of his worst seasons, like the Jets are still a playoff team. If he plays better than that, they can be more than that. But they they can just need him to be healthy, and then they could, they could really make some noise because I they have some talent on offense, maybe not a lot of depth at wide receiver, but Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, like these guys, they're really, really good. So um, right. I think the I think Aaron has looked quite good. Uh, to simplify it. Speaking of of Rodgers and, and and Garrett Wilson, who obviously I mean still was good last year despite the horrific quarterback yeah. play uh, the Jets had uh, after the Rodgers injury. Uh, you, you reported last week that the connection between Rodgers and Wilson has hit I guess something of a of a rough patch after a really hot start to to training camp. I I saw in your piece that head coach Robert Sala said uh, everyone is still sort of trying to figure it out and maybe possibly overthinking the Jets playbook. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you if there's any, you think, long-term cause for concern with this Rodgers-Wilson thing. We saw them, you know, exchanging words on the sideline. Rodgers didn't seem to think much of it. But is there is there anything there for any concern for the long run here? In terms of concern, I know. I don't think so. I think – Garrett Wilson is going to, at the end of the season, if we're even just talking in fantasy, like if Aaron Rodgers is his quarterback all or most of the year, like this is a top 10 receiver, if not more. Like I think he has that ability. And uh, you said you saw the production he had for two years with maybe the worst quarterback situation in the NFL. And the, the interesting thing about the stuff with him and Aaron is, and Aaron has kind of like specifically brought this up and Garrett has to a degree. Like Garrett is so talented and athletic and he's so good at like improvising out there. So his like, instinct is to improvise when he gets out in the open field to try and get open where Aaron, you know, he doesn't want to take that away from him, but he also wants to be like, look, sometimes you need to be where I think you're going to be mm-hmm. so I can get you the ball. Whether Garrett's covered or not, he's going to be able to catch the ball. So I think that's kind of like the balance they're trying to find with each other. Like you don't want to take away as, as the coaching staff here, like say Garrett's superpower, but you also want him to be within the flow of the offense because Aaron, if you're going to the place where Aaron thinks you're going to be, he's going to find you. So I think that's just kind of the balance they're trying to find. I think ultimately I, I'm not worried about those two. I, there may be other concerns that you could point to, but the, the two of them, I, I think, you know, the chemistry was very high last summer. I think the start camp this year was really good. They, they hit a little bit of a rough patch as the offense was struggling, but ultimately I, I think they're going to be fine. When you were talking, I could not help go to the clickbait realm in my brain. And like, as, as, as uh, I'm just like, everything Zach says in my brain makes me think, all right, they're trading a second rounder for Devontae Adams. No, <laughs> no. And, but, uh, cause that is, that has always been the thing with Rodgers is, yeah, he's been like, like Tom Brady, like you, you got to do it my way. It's my system, yeah. but it's hard to believe he can't. They can square the peg or the, the, well, I'm messing up metaphors here. They can figure it out with Garrett Wilson. And, uh, but you mentioned the lack of receiving depth and Mike Williams who's currently on the pup list. First off, is Mike Williams expected to begin the year healthy or is he going to be on the reserve pup list, which costs him four games? He will seamlessly slide in as the wide receiver too upon his return, right? There won't be any like funny Alan Lazard business that even though we know he's Aaron's guy, but we yeah. just saw a player who was no longer up to it last year and just is Mike Williams the clear cut wide receiver too. He, it, it it's all dependent on when he's healthy enough to be the Mike Williams they signed. You know, I think I still have a lot of, I think talent wise, he's unquestionably like a very good receiver. I think we've all seen him at his best is one of the most dynamic downfield weapons you have, but we haven't seen him on the practice field. He tore his ACL late in the season um, or I forget what week it was, uh, but he tore, he tore his ACL last year and he has not practiced for a second with this team. So they can all say, we think he's going to be great we don't know what a guy looks like coming off ACL until you see him out there. So mm-hmm. I think it's fair to question what that's going to look like. I asked Robert Sala today about when he thinks he might get back in the practice field. He kind of was cagey. Didn't really. So we'll see, he's see the doctor still. Um, they've been, they've been saying he's going to, he's going on the same plan as Brees Hall last year. I looked it up. I think Brees was activated off PUP around August 15th, I believe last year. So it's another 10 days. And then he was ready for week one. They've always said the goal is for Mike Williams to be ready week one. I don't know if he'll have a full, full workload right away. So um, in terms of the funny business with Lazard, I think you might see some of that at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, depth, it, like that that's part of the reason why depth is kind of a concern for me right now because they've 
they've been really banged up. Or Xavier Gibson, who's their top slot receiver right now, he'd been out for a little while. He came back today. Um, Malachi Corley, I think they're still trying to make him earn his stripes a little bit. Hasn't mm-hmm. got a lot of first team reps. Jason Brownlee's a young guy they liked last year. He was struggling up until like a couple of days ago. Alan Lazard, as you mentioned, you know, arguably the least productive starting receiver in the NFL last year. If you just look at like yards per route run. Um, and so then you still have like, that's, I mean, you're running out of <laughs> running, I'm yes. running out of your names in my head. Or Ir- Irv Charles <laughs> is like their other big guy and he's a special teams guy. So it's a, uh, it's a concern because it, you know, especially if you hypothetically like Garrett Wilson goes down for even a few plays, mm-hmm. like they don't really have many threats at wide receiver right now. So you need Mike Williams back. So right. all of a sudden the depth looks okay. Then, then Al Lazard's just Mike Williams as backup as opposed to the number two wide receiver on a team that wants to win the Super Bowl. Alan Lazard, uh, by the metrics, maybe the worst receiver in the NFL, happens to be good friends with Aaron Rodgers. So that that's good, I think, for him personally. Uh, I I did I just wanted to ask you uh, quickly about the slot position. I know that the um, uh, uh, initial depth chart for the Jets has Gibson at not Gibson Gibson as the uh, the top slot receiver, and then Corley uh, second team. Um, tell me, there's a path. Is there a path for the rookie? To claim that that slot receiver position, you said is, is they're making him earn his stripes. Is is he going to get there by week one? I, I'm. <laughs> I need. I need to see. I need to see how he looks in the preseason, uh-huh. honestly, because okay. I think a big part of of Malachi, Malachi's game is like the after the tackle stuff, the after mm-hmm. the catch stuff. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get a lot of that. And the Jets have a very. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a nice word. They don't. They don't tackle to the ground. They. It's not very hard hitting, and so mm-hmm. it's like a pretty soft camp, frankly. Um, and so I, I think a guy like that, he's made for like taking hits, which is unique for wide receiver. It's what makes him so unique. So I, I, I don't think you're going to see him. He has made some great plays uh, as camp has progressed, but I think they really do trust Xavier Gibson. They like him a lot. He's been the top slot guy since the spring. I, I just think as of now, like if the season were to start tomorrow, I think Malachi is more of a gadget guy for them. I, I might change my tune as we get closer to the season. But the, one thing the coaches always bring up whenever you ask about him is that he needs to work on his route running. That he's like very raw in terms of like his route running. So I think there's still a few steps for him before he's like full time role guy. They they wanted him really bad. So I you're not you're not talking about training up for a guy in the second round. You're not you know celebrating to get him in the third round if you don't plan on using him right away. If he's not ready, that's another question. But um, I I think the talent is absolutely there. And I, again, I, I need to see him in the preseason. I think that's when we'll know how ready he is to contribute. If he doesn't do much, then I'm, I'm going to be a little more skeptical. But I'd say as of now, Xavier Gibson is the clear starter at slot receiver. All yeah, right. as we know, yeah, it's very difficult, especially these days, to read into preseason usage. But I think you're absolutely correct uh, with a guy like Malachi Corley. If he's not doing much in the preseason, he is someone where it is a red flag. Where you're like, oh wow, like, nah. like we know that teams don't take that this seriously anymore. But this is a guy who should be showing us something in the preseason. And by the way, Mike Williams, he went down last week three late September last year. So it's right a little concerning that he's not practicing yeah. at all, but he is a veteran. I think he's over 30. So probably still just taking it slow with him, uh, but something definitely to keep in mind for fantasy drafters. And so we talk about all this lack of depth, how we don't even really know what the roles are amongst the guys who are healthy and are going to be out there. Uh, Zach, does that lead to maybe like dot connecting for a lot of targets for a guy like Tyler Conklin, who was kind of an unsung hero last year, over 60 catches, would have been a bigger deal in fantasy, but he could not score a solitary <laughs> touchdown with how <laughs> yeah. bad these quarterbacks were. Uh, how does the pass catching the targets, do you think, line up for someone like Tyler Conklin and or just the Jets tight ends in general? I, I, I'm i very high on Tyler Conklin. I think he flies under the radar and like – in terms of the league, and it's it's easy to understand why if you look at what he's had to deal with the last couple of years. His lack of touchdowns last year, I blame more on the quarterbacks than on him, frankly. I I, I really do think that, you know, I, with the quarterback play they had, and it kind of is like the Garrett Wilson thing to a smaller scale. Like over the last two years, I believe he's like seventh in receptions and yards among all tight ends. And wow. that's without many t- touchdowns, obviously, and a lot not a, as many opportunities he should have. It, him and Aaron Rodgers have a real chemistry he doesn't really drop much that's thrown to him. The coaches trust him. So I think he's going to be out there most of the time. They really like Jeremy Ruckert as the, the number two tight end. I think he's going to play a legit role. He's a better blocker. So, you know, he'll spell him a little bit. But I, I really do think Kyle Conklin with some solid quarterback plays in line for like a career year. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really high on him as a target. And, as you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, we're talking about the lack of depth. And like his name just keeps rising to the top when you just like break it down. I'm like, okay, I have concerns here, here, here. I have no concerns about him, Brees, or Garrett Wilson. Like those three guys, I think are going to be studs for fantasy and real life. And so, 
I'm uh yeah, I'm, Conklin in particular is, is somebody I wouldn't sleep on in terms of fantasy for sure. Maybe Getting just, to the back. No, Sorry, Danny, but, I got Conklin real quick. You may yeah, have just yeah. goosed his ADP. And do you have any idea what his horrid nickname in the fantasy football world is? I don't even know if you can print it in the New York Times. <laughs> um, Tyler Conklin is known as the Conk Daddy. Um, in the fantasy football community. <laughs> I do maybe, not know that actually. Uh, I was gonna say uh, maybe you should tell him that, or maybe don't tell him. Yeah, that. I mean, look, I, when Tet says <laughs> no one has, it, it, Pat calls him that. You know, <laughs> it's and just me. No, it's just him, and, <laughs> and just so me, but, uh, he's acting like it's an industry-wide thing. It's it's just it's just him saying that, and it's it makes, it very, it makes me all very my friends are saying it. Yeah, all my friends say it. It's, yeah, <laughs> right, right. People are saying. <laughs> Many I, people are saying. I mean, my, yeah, my my wife sees my text and it says "conk daddy," and I and I don't know how to explain it. You know, but <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to uh, get us far afield here. Yeah, Denny was let's, moving on. Do yeah, you know, let's uh, get back to football. Yeah. Uh, let, let's get back to the the backfield for the Jets. So Braylon Allen has gotten a lot of buzz, a lot of uh, training camp hype. I think it's well deserved. Um, he's listed as RB two on the initial Jets depth chart. So are we looking at a situation where if, you know, God forbid, Brees Hall misses any time this year, Allen is the clear cut number one in that backfield? I think so. I think it's a pretty clear delineation before between you have Brees number one, I think is clear. I think Braylon Hall, the number two. And then after that, they have another kid they drafted, Isaiah Davis. Tariq Cohen just retired. I thought he had a shot to to make the team as a backup. Izzy Abanacan is a guy they drafted last year who has kind of been a disappointment. So they, they don't really have a lot of other options, but I do think Braylon Allen has been really, really impressive to me to the point where, like, I think they should try and work him into the offense if they can. I, I think Brees is going to be a legit uh, workhorse. They're going to give him, you know, he's going to be a heavy part of the passing game. He's going to get a lot of carries. I think he's going to be like a true bell cow. But I, if Braylon Allen brings a different flavor, it's like a thunder and lightning type of thing. He's mm -hmm. a really strong runner. He's a better pass catcher than I thought. Like they've really used him as a pass catcher in practice mm -hmm. and dating back to OTAs. And he, they like, they trust him already, I think, uh, in protection, which is always a telltale sign yeah. for like a rookie. Whereas Izzy Ponaconda was kind of on the inactive list until the end of last season because they did not trust him to in terms of the blocking. So I'm very intrigued by Braylon. I'm very curious to see how much they give him if they let him spell Brees maybe more than I think they will. But yeah, ultimately, if you're looking for a, a good handcuff, I, I think Braylon should be on the list. I do. I, I have a another backfield related question, and that we don't have this on the on the show sheet. And I'm sorry, I'm going I'm going rogue, Pat. Uh, so I have written about how I think Brees Hall is in for a lot of targets, a lot of pass game usage, and I got a ton of pushback, like immediately saying that no, 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 you don't understand. Aaron Rodgers does not throw to running backs ever, <laughs> and. So, okay. I mean, it's sort of fair. If you look at, if you look at his, his past and there's a lot to look at for a guy, Rogers age, my age, uh, by the way. And, uh, like, and on, yeah, I mean, we were born like at the same, like in the, within the same three the same hospital, period. you were best friends, but you no longer speak. But, so, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, um, it, but there are seasons where he did check down some, there are seasons where the running back saw no yeah. action. Do you, do you think that Brees Hall is ingrained in this passing game? Or is this like a, like a Rogers, centric offense that if he doesn't if he doesn't want to throw to the running backs it's just not going to happen no i i, I don't whatever his history is i Brees hall is going to be if if not one b in the passing game he'll be number two in the passing game like I, I think he's going to get a heavy dose of targets i think last year jets fans i mean they they kind of don't like nathaniel hackett in general i would say but um i'd say when he admitted that he at the end of the season that he didn't realize how good Brees was as a pass catcher until week nine <laughs> Uh, I think that set off some alarm bells. I think he yes. learned his lesson. Uh, and so I, I think out of the gate, you're going to see Brees getting a lot of a lot of catches. I think he's going to set up the offense in a lot of ways. He'll have more room to operate uh, if the passing game is actually a threat, um, which it wasn't last year. So I'm very curious to see how much they target him. But I, I really, he's going to be up there with the Christian McCaffrey types in terms of touches, I think. Let's go. That's what we absolutely love to hear. Zach, we've already taken a lot of your time. But try to get everyone out here on this boilerplate. Uh, hopefully easy to answer question, but you kind of already answered it getting into the really deep names on this roster because the Jets are a team where a, a dark horse sleeper is almost going to have to emerge. And I'm not even really asking you who like a fantasy sleeper is, but just who is someone, who maybe a, a Jet skill player who surprised you during the offseason program and maybe continuing into training camp, someone who's caught your eye that we aren't really talking about. 
Um, we've alluded to him a little bit, so I'll just to change it up. I would have said Braylon Allen probably if we didn't already talk about him. But uh, Xavier Gibson, honestly, is somebody um, that's intriguing to me just because the coaching staff has hyped him up quite a bit all offseason. And sometimes they do that, and then the guy you, you see out, and then you go and see practice, the guy's not getting a lot of reps. But they've had him as the slot receiver with the first team all offseason. I think he's he has some chemistry in Aaron Rodgers who really, really likes him. I think he pushed for him to stay on the 53 last year. Wow. He's their top returner. So – um, he's kind of, you know, he's not the same kind of player as Corley, but he is kind of gadgety in the way that they can get him the ball out of the backfield and stuff like that. So if they trust him more than Corley and Rogers trust him, I, he, he could be an intriguing guy, especially if there's some injuries uh, around him, which, you know, with this group, that's very possible. So Xavier Gibson's like a very low key, like dark horse guy, I would say. Interesting. That's very, very valuable information to have. Very valuable stuff the entire time, Zach. Uh, with, with, again, a team that it feels like, you know, they're like set to contend, like they're a known commodity and like a known entity. But yeah, there's just a lot of questions mm -hmm. with the yeah. Jets and especially with these skill players, not nearly as many with the defense. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to help us sort through this and tell our listeners where they can find you on social media. And we know they can just Google the Jets athletic to find your work, but uh, tell them <laughs> nevertheless where they can find you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm on Twitter at Zach Blatt, Z-A-C-K. Uh, people always spell my name wrong. So I got to point that out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've, we have a Jets podcast called Can't Wait, which is uh, named after the famous Bart Scott post game interview. So, um, if you if you're curious about the Jets, we talk we do that a couple times a week during the season and like once a week during the off season. So, well, awesome stuff on the Jets beat. Uh, we cite you frequently at Rotor, hopefully guys. accurately. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, at the, the aggregation game mistakes can be made sometimes. But we try uh, to not be clickbaity, and you are absolutely essential source on the Jets Thanks. beat. Zach, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Thanks, Zach. See you guys. Really, really good stuff. And yeah, again, just queuing up to take Denny. I'm on the clock. Uh, it's the 18th round and nine different best ball drafts for me right now. And I just took Xavier Gibson and all of them. Yeah. I And I've been uh, quarreling with uh, folks online who are all in somehow on Gibson. And I'm in, I'm in on Corley and I was wrong. I'm, I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, you actually might be wrong. I was I'm completely sorry. wrong. It was yeah. Gibson the whole time. Well, he, Zach did as good of a job as he could breaking it down with the Jets. They are just a confusing team. Like, I'm, I don't know. Sometimes you intellectually know something like the Jets aren't that deep. Like the Jets need no. to stay healthy. And then when you hear someone like Zach, really, he was pulling out names, you know, that a lot of fancy managers probably have not thought of all summer. And it's right. kind of an alarming situation where if Garrett Wilson gets injured, man, like Aaron Rodgers might be like retiring. Look, week 10. I, I, I'm with you. It's not deep. It's Garrett, it's Aaron, and it's Brees, and that's it. And maybe they actually do. I've made it a meme. Maybe they legit need to trade for Devontae Adams. Like, um, um, I, I mean, it would be, I think, a smart move. I don't know if they can like handle all that money, but um, uh, and 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 again, you know, when I'm when I'm drafting my 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 redraft teams, I'm not talking best ball. I know we're all best ball brained right now, but <laughs> in, in redraft, um the sensitivity of this situation scares me. Uh, and, and so when I, when I want to draft Garrett Wilson, when I want to draft Brees Hall, especially Brees Hall, I'm, I'm into as a zero RB guy, even, even though I do that, it, I, I do like Brees Hall a lot. Uh, it scares me because without Rogers, what, what is it for? Like this, this all just goes into the dumps again, like it did last year. It's what even is it with him? And, Really, I'm not trying to be a Rodgers hater, but he's 40 and has played one game in two years. And yeah. like we said, his worst season since 2008 was 2022. It's just he he's so gifted. Even a diminished old, like aging Aaron Rodgers is one of the most gifted football players I've ever seen. But yeah, they, they need a lot to go right um, this year. The Jets, yeah. And yeah. they will have it on defense. You know, um, a team that needs a lot to go right, Denny. I wasn't saying the Patriots. We'll talk about the, the Dolphins first, though. We'll save the Patriots for the very, very last. Uh, you did our team preview on the Dolphins. You have some excellent prompts for the Miami Dolphins, and you you make the extremely good point. They, they lost a ton of defensive talent. Uh, they hired one of the worst defensive coordinators in recent memory. Uh, they enjoyed a lot of positive game script in 2023. These are all your words. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? They are the Miami Dolphins who made the fantasy ATM go burr in the first half of the season last year. Uh, not nearly as much in the second half. But what does it mean if they're chasing points way more often in 2024? 
I think it changes the fantasy landscape for everybody in this offense, from Tua to Tyreek Hill to Jalen Waddle to Achan Moster, everybody, even John U. Smith. I think everybody can be very much affected by a different sort of dog. I'm sorry, my, my dog, by the way. Uh, um, Ziggy has been fired. Ziggy is once again barking. Uh, it's something. It's something. Ziggy's un- the one NBC employee not doing a good job during the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what can you do? Um, it doesn't matter. He's very quiet, actually. And uh, so we have, uh, yeah. So just just to talk about what, who the Dolphins lost uh, as far as defensive talent goes, they lost the following players in free agency: interior defensive line staple Christian Wilkins, linebackers Jerome Baker and Andrew Van Ginkle, safeties Deshaun Elliott and Brandon Jones. They all they're all gone. That group combined for nearly four thousand defensive snaps in twenty twenty three. I think this could be a really leaky defense that leads to Mike McDaniel having to keep his foot on the gas because last year the Dolphins enjoyed a ton of positive game script. Uh, only four teams had more positive game script had more game script in their favor. Um, as far as offensive plays go. So uh, chasing points, that means that they're they're Obviously, you have to throw a little more. They were very conservative with leads of seven points or more. One of the more conservative teams in the NFL in those situations. Uh, so that increases play volume, pass volume, the whole thing. Maybe, maybe, like I said a couple weeks ago with you and Kyle, maybe skinny Tua can do it. Maybe a Tua who can move outside the pocket a little bit, make a play out of structure. Maybe that combined with having to chase points a little bit makes this Dolphins offense as good as we want it to be, as fun as we want it to be. Skinny Tua, if you're listening, uh, roll out and make one play. ever. One play. Uh, one play. And, and Mike McDaniel, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, make one adjustment ever. Yeah, um, yeah that, that too. I think uh, I love Mike McDaniel. I think part of like the lack of Mike McDaniel adjustments – it's just been he's had a lack of cards to play where we look at the offense and it seems so talented, but yeah, lack of depth. Maybe it kind of ha- maybe people might scoff at a lack of depth when you have Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, but they've been struggling for so long to fill that third receiver spot, uh, getting nothing from the tight end position. And so, yeah, hopefully this year we can just see a little more dyna- dynamism. From D- this dynamism. Dynamism. Something like uh, that. I, I, just real quick on Jalen Waddle, I've, I've warmed up to Waddle. I think. I was kind of hating on Waddle when we talked about the Dolphins a few weeks ago with Kyle. Um, but I, I've warmed up because I kind of see the path toward, you know, you know, more playing from behind, more passing, and his targets per route run went from I had it here, 22 and a half percent in 2022 to 27% in 2023. That's a big jump. And I think if, if something like that holds where he's basically targeted on one in four routes, um, I think I think that that could be tremendous. I think we could see a situation where Tyreek and Waddle are both, I don't know, top eight receivers in fantasy. Well, and as we alluded to with the conk daddy earlier, uh, Jalen Waddle was kind of like unsustainably cold on touchdowns he, last man, year. Super cold. Yes. He's way, way too good. of Even when you're playing behind a Colossus like Tyreek Hill, a player as talented as Jalen Waddle is usually going to score way more than four touchdowns. That was a flukily low total. I mean, Jalen had some injury issues last year. He only played in 14 games, and he he was limited for a lot of others. So that was probably part of it. But Jalen Waddle is going to score more than four touchdowns this year. Uh, by the way, you mentioned the, the Mostert and A-Shane splits and how they're very frustrating for people who want to take A-Shane in the second round, something I quite literally did in our Apex Experts yeah. League uh, today. It, what needs to change for Devin Ashan to make me not lose sleep at night for taking yeah, him in the second? Right, game? right. So yeah, I mean, I look, I I think that things are going to have to change in order for Achan to, you know, meet that second round ADP. Um, you know, I looked the, at the bank examiner. Listen, I don't even. He, I swear, he just got a new car two weeks ago. He's already got a new car after he heard I took Devin Achan. Once again, idling. He finally got out of my driveway, but idling right in front of my mailbox. The bank the yeah. man can get around. The, him. the bank examiner now has two cyber trucks, which I think <laughs> I think that's excessive. No, no, the bank examiner is the one guy still out there driving a sedan. He's got a full size sedan. It's a Mercedes. <laughs> this thing is beautiful. I, I will admit, it's beautiful. Yeah, and um, it gets nine nine miles to the gallon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just real quick 
on the on the ba- uh, Dolphins backfield. So from week 13 on, so D- uh, Devon Achan returned in week 13 from from injury. Um, and looking at that stretch, week 13 through the end of the season, uh, Moster saw 63% of the Dolphins red zone snaps uh, to 28% for Achan. This is actually according to uh, Jacob Gibbs from CBS Sports, who's a good follow on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter. Um, Achan had five red zone touches during that late season stretch to 13 for Moster. So I think, Pat, I think we're going to need to see something of a flip there in role in order for Achan to meet that ADP. Now, I still think that he could be not disastrous, even if that that usage holds up. But Mostert could be a problem. He could be a problem. Mostert, he stayed healthy to his credit. Something had been tough for him to do. He stayed healthy, I think, two years in a row now. Uh, but Mostert was really running low on gas at the end of last season. like To the point where I feel like maybe the Dolphins had to almost secretly begin planning on turning the page. Mm. The season. I'm optimistic from that perspective, too, that Raheem Mostert just might not have a whole lot left to give. Uh, or he probably took way too many touches for uh, his skill set and age last year and injury history. Uh, and so I, I am optimistic on HN. I will say, I, I kind of forgot this. Uh, I reminded myself this morning looking at the the numbers that HN was kind of a workhorse in college. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not like he's been used sparingly throughout his entire football life. Um, you know, he, he saw 75% of the snaps. Um, during his final year in college. Uh, so, I mean, you know, he has that history. I think that's encouraging. There's no way he just won't immediately get hurt again, right? Um, right. That is uh, that is one thing that I do worry about with the small-ish HM. Denny, I wrote for the New England Patriots, do we care about any of these people? At all? <laughs> I may have used uh, uh, Do we care about any of these guys? Uh, anyone at all? Apparently you do. Uh, you wrote something. Yeah. About, I'm not even going to read what you wrote here about Ramondre Stevenson. Just tell the people Look, your we, thoughts on Ramondre. We this is a this is a preview, and we're gonna we're gonna preview every team, even if it's a team as ugly as the Patriots. And man, this team, this roster, is really quite ugly. Although, don't tell Jalen Polk or Javon Baker that these guys, the enemy, is speaking kindly and holding a knife. <laughs> For for these Patriots receivers, <laughs> they they they're they're holding court with the with the uh, beat writers every day and being like <laughs> being like they, we we see the enemy mm-hmm. and we want the enemy to know we're coming. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Jalen Polk, you know, could could be interesting. A second round pick. Beat writers think that he he could be the team's top receiver come week one. Uh, from all reports, he's an underneath option, which we like. We like a PPR scam. Okay. I think Polk profiles as a scam, scamish type player, but I do think Polk's college usage and 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 his uh, and his numbers from Washington could suggest a guy who gets that underneath stuff, but also some downfield opportunities, and that's really what you want. Like that's the that's the ultimate for a receiver, right? You get the easy stuff, and then some some of the big downfield stuff. So I think Polk is obviously interesting, and then in the backfield. Stevenson. Yeah, Poke, Poke is definitely a guy where there's at least a case to be constructed. A, yeah. a, not, like a, a sensical case, too. It's not all hopium. Like there's a, actually like cases that can be made, credible cases that can right. be made for Jalen Poke making a rookie fantasy impact. Yeah, Reminder Stevenson, you've taken umbrage with his ADP. Yeah, look, RB23 in PPR format's the only legitimate format. And um, he's going after Zamir White and Aaron Jones. I don't Yikes. think that that's I don't think that's right. No. I think that that's wrong. Um, I will say I'm not I'm not someone who's like targeting Ramondre Stevenson in every draft. Just curious because, because of the <laughs> just because of the nature I think of the New England offense. Um, but you know, new Patriots uh, offensive coordinator Alex Van Pelt runs the same offense. This guy been the offense. offensive coordinator for all 32 teams, man. Alex Van Pelt, Pelt, well, yeah. he was with, he's a Stefanski guy and I like Stefanski. I, I believe in the Stefanski system. Um, so maybe, maybe that translates, but Stevenson played in this offense uh, at Oklahoma, which I think is good for familiarity purposes. Uh, he got like a massive raise with the contracts ex- extension this off season. Um, he's making uh, $9 million a year now. And, Really, I mean, you look at a guy like Antonio Gibson, um, although I, I have done some truthing for Gibson. Um, you know, he's likely, I think, a breather back or, you know, a, a, a kick returner. And with the, with the you know, 
updated uh, kicking rules in the league, I think Gibson could be sort of interesting if if your league rewards points for that sort of thing. Um, I you know the question is, can the Patriots create the sort of game script where they can lean on Stevenson? I don't think so. But if he if he's involved in the pass game, then we're talking. Then we're talking a guy who is immune to game script, and we like that a lot. Yeah, there's. I feel like there's some sort of incongruency going on from Andre Stevenson because you know, Bill Belichick really de-emphasized him as a receiver last yeah. year. He still caught a lot of passes, but Zeke was the the, the Patriots' pass catching back. And then they sign Antonio Gibson. We're I mean, pretty well established at this point. Like the one thing Antonio Gibson is going to give you is pass catching. So like, man, I'm like all the way out on Ramondre Stevenson. This is back to back coaching staff saying they don't want Ramondre Stevenson catching so many passes. Then they give him that totally insane contract yeah. that you referenced. So I just don't entirely know what to think with the Patriots backfield, but I think your reading of it is pretty. I mean, the money speaks for itself with Ramondre Stevenson, and probably just have to not worry about the Gibson. Factor. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it really. I know we shouldn't. You shouldn't base your entire valuation of a player on their contract situation obviously we've 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 done that before it's a pitfall just be careful but when you fact i think you need to factor that in like what like if they were out on stevenson as a franchise as an organization we would know it yes and 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 th this is not that um, yeah i thought i honestly thought that they were and then they decisively demonstrated yeah. the exact opposite so so i think you know i mean if you're if you're going receiver heavy in drafts and you want to nab a dead zone guy, a dead zone running back, which sounds so unappealing. I know, but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, but great I think, branding the dead zone, you know, you could do better. I mean, I'm sorry. You could do way worse than Ramondre Stevenson in the dead zone. You can also do a lot better. Man, you could probably do better as well. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter at all if it's Jacoby Brissett or Drake may final question. Oh, I think it matters. Yeah. Uh, I think it matters because Drake may is going to take off after one read. And um and Jacoby Brissett is a statue. Okay, so Jacoby Brissett's gonna stand there. He will. <laughs> our, our guy Jacoby, he, he ain't going anywhere. <laughs> no one you? stands there no. like Jacoby. He's gonna say he's gonna let the play develop. I will and... be there. Uh, yeah, I will be there. I'm Jacoby Brissett. So I I actually think for Stevenson's purposes, Jacoby Brissett is like a dream come true because my guy, he's not he's not moving. <laughs> My guy, my guy, not my guy, frozen. Uh, yeah, my my guy, not moving. Nope. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, listen. I know, like, we get a lot of the home deliveries these days. Everyone does. Some people try to nice. They try to set up like bottles of water, maybe a little snack for some of the delivery drivers. I've seen that before. I don't think my wife should have done that for the bank examiner, though. Like, I, we didn't ask him to be here. He's not giving us anything cool. He's just waiting to take our home. Um, when all these uh, these bags, quote unquote, and your and your kids, there. your kids should not have washed his car. No. That I thought that 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 was a little over the top. Yeah. Now, it's, of course, it's a beautiful gleaming chrome black now. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's we nice. shouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh, we should not have uh, ended the show, but we have to because we're out of time, we're out of topics. Really, really good stuff from Joe Biscalia and Zach Rosenblatt. They are must follows on their respective beats. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be back on Thursday, with Mr. Kyle Dvorak. We're going to be back next Tuesday to preview the NFC East, our final division in our eight-team series. Thank you so much to all the guests we've had so far. Thank you so much to Danny Carter. We could not do it without him. Um, so for Danny, I'm Pat. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in 48 hours. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBCSports.com and RotorWorld.com, and I want to thank you so much for watching whatever it is you just watched, or if nothing else, being too lazy to click out of the autoplay after this video started after whatever it is you actually wanted to watch finished. But now that you're here, I'd like to take a moment here to ask you respectfully, respectfully now, okay? I'm asking you respectfully to subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel. You'll get the latest Roto World fantasy news headlines, all sorts of great shows, including my own fantasy football happy hour. So go subscribe now. Again, I'm asking respectfully.